The Battle for Azeroth expansion can be described as many things, but for the average lore consumer, it can be explained as complicated. While Blizzard has improved their storytelling immensely over the past couple of expansions, Battle for Azeroth was filled with dozens of storylines that can be difficult to follow. It's like, okay, so there's a giant sword in the world, but there's also this powerful resource also, called Azerite, really sad, but there's also this synthetic old god created by the Pantheon to use as an experiment, but he has, has the 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 Oh wait, also we're fighting, he dies, oh no, but he also might be here, there's a log in his mind, Roscon goes, to use these relics to consume all of Azeroth. What the f is that thing? Oh, and then we go on a cruise boat, and then we fall into also, this giant Rodin hole. Is here, and hey, look, the giant sword is, sword is still in Azeroth. Oh, hey, look, it's actually a shard. Oh, hey, look, it's actually a shard. Oh, hey, look, it's actually a shard. And now, and all of a sudden, it's And now, Sylvanas is free. And now, Sylvanas is uber-powerful and ripped a hole through space and time to the Shadowlands. How did we get here? Why is Sylvanas so powerful? And out of all of this lore, what is important for you to know to understand what is going on in Shadowlands? Well, to answer those questions, we are going to need to go back a couple of expansions. Sylvanas used to be alive, but during the Siege of Quothalas, she did a kick-ass power slide right in front of Arthas and was turned into a banshee. Eventually, she'd become the leader of the Forsaken, and it was her life's... well, undead life's mission to kill the Lich King for what he did to her. Jump to the Wrath of the Lich King, and Tyrion Forgering and the player characters kill the Lich King. The problem is, there must always be a Lich King. If the Scourge are left without a leader, they'll just swarm across Azeroth in a frenzy. So Bolvar Fordragon chooses to sacrifice himself to be the new Lich King instead. Sylvanas was not able to see Arthas fall firsthand because... I, I guess she was stuck in, in traffic, I guess, and the Banshee Queen ventured to the Frozen Throne after just to make sure that Arthas was dead. He was gone, so I guess he was dead, and the victory was empty for Sylvanas. In her undead life, she was depressed, but driven by vengeance. Now, she was just depressed, so she threw herself off the Frozen Throne onto the spikes below. In death, Sylvanas only saw darkness. In the short story, The Edge of Night, it's described as, there were others in the darkness, things she could not recognize, because nothing so terrible could exist in the world of the living. Claws tore at her, but she had no mouth with which to scream. Eyes looked at her, but she could not look back. This was to be her eternity, the endless void, the dark, unknown realm of anguish. We can assume that this horrific reality Sylvanas was in was the Maw, a realm in the Shadowlands where irredeemable souls are damned to live in anguish for all eternity. Within the Maw, Sylvanas was offered a deal by nine Valkyrs, one in which would take her place in the Maw so she could return back to the land of the living, which is depicted in this totally not over-sexualized art. Although this wasn't in the short story, we know that this is when Sylvanas got in contact with an ancient being called the Jailer, also known as Lord Avil, is it? Evil, action. Doctor. Even. The details about Sylvanas and the ruler of the Maw's relationship is still unknown, but what we do know is they've made a pact with each other, and every soul that goes into the Maw makes the Jailer and Sylvanas much more powerful. You complete me. I love you. Now with a hidden motive to make herself more powerful, Sylvanas is brought back to our reality to live once more. The Cataclysm expansion happens, and nothing is important except for Garrosh calling Sylvanas a bitch. Nothing important happens in Mist of Pandaria. Warlords of Draenor happens, and truly, everything is pointless. Legion happens, and demons are raging across Azeroth. In the Battle for the Broken Shore, the Horde's war chief Vol'jin is killed by a random Felguard. 
In Vol'jin's final moments, a mysterious whisper invaded his mind, compelling him to make Sylvanas war chief in his last dying breath. Turns out, this mysterious whisper was Muzala, a Loa of death who serves the Jailer. With Sylvanas as war chief, she has a ton of sway in the fate of Azeroth, but before her plans can be put into motion, we need to defeat the Legion. The rest of the expansion involves doing just that. Meanwhile, at some point during the end of Legion, the Jailer broke how the Shadowlands works. Typically, souls are sent to an endless amount of pocket dimensions that suit them best, but now, every soul is being sent straight into the Maw, making the Jailer and Sylvanas incredibly powerful. Also, the ruler of the Burning Legion, Sargeras, stabs a giant sword in Azeroth as he's being defeated. Now there's a new powerful resource called Azerite, which incentivizes the Horde and the Alliance to fight each other. Secretly, Sylvanas' hidden motive is to cause as much death in Azeroth to make her and the Jailer more powerful. Sylvanas starts the fourth war off with a bang and commits mass genocide and burns down Teldrassil, giving her and the Jailer... One million souls. The battle for Lordaeron happens, and Sylvanas is using chemical warfare on the Alliance and her own troops. Hmm, I wonder why. The expansion continues and we get busy dealing with problems in Xandalar and Kul Tiras. The battle for Dazarlor happens and the Alliance brings the fight to the Xandalari. Sylvanas is nowhere to be seen, and King Rostakhan dies. The Night Elves want revenge for Teldrassil, and the battle for Darkshore happens, and Tyrande is especially pissed. The High Priestess of Elune performs an ancient ritual that involves sacrificing an orc head into a moon well and turns into a Night Warrior. An avatar of Elune's wrath, and now she is ready to kick ass. During the battle, Tyrande and Malfurion confront two Valkyrs and Nathanos. Oh, you guys don't know who Nathanos is. Well, uh, Nathanos is basically uh, Sylvanas' tier 3 sub henchman who is literally just a dead guy with a bow. You would think that two demigods versus a dead guy with a bow would go something like this. But in reality, Nathanos puts up a fight and it ends with one of the Valkyrs dying and he goes, Witch! You shall pay dearly for that. Let's move! And then he flies away. This is literally my least favorite event that's ever happened in Warcraft history. The Night Elves win the battle and reclaim Darkshore unceremoniously. Back on the continent of Kul Taras, there are some Naga that are trying to consume all of Azeroth in a giant storm, so we go kill them. Aid your faithful servant, almighty Nazar! At the end of the raid, a mysterious blade called Zalatath appears. Word players take it and give it to Sylvanas. Sylvanas uses the blade to strike a deal with Queen Ajara, who she got in contact with by calling her on the phone or teleporting there or something. Here's what you need to know. Queen Ajara, Sylvanas, and the Zoth are not working together. It's more like they're all schemers who think they themselves benefit most from this alliance. The plan is, the Horde and the Alliance fall into Nashitar. Queen Ajara will then coerce them into the Eternal Palace, and use their hearts of Azeroth to unleash Nazoth from his prison. <laughs> then, she will drive Zalatath into the Old God, killing him and finally freeing herself from her master. Sylvanas benefits from this interaction by having all of the Horde and the Alliance champions dead. What Sylvanas and Ajara don't know is Nazoth is the old god of infinite truths and can foresee all possible futures. He has been manipulating this event behind the scenes and knows Ashara will fail and he will be unleashed. This is the empire I have built. Past, present, future. That is just the plan. What really happens is Horde adventurers sail towards Nashatar because Nagas are bad and we need to kill them, and the Alliance follows closely behind because 
Nagas and Horde are bad, so we need to kill them. Both factions fall right into Ajara's trap, and she becomes Fish Moses and parts the sea. She achieves this by using the Tide Stone of Golgoneth. Tide Stone. That might ring a bell for you. Back in Legion, we used the Tide Stone in the Tomb of Sargeras. I guess we just forgot about this incredibly powerful artifact, and Queen Ajara just waltzed into the Tomb of Sargeras and took it. Look, I understand this lore isn't important for you to understand Shadowlands, but it's also just completely batshit insane, and I feel like I need to tell you about it. Anyways, the Horde and the Alliance are now stranded on Najatar's ocean floor and need to learn how to survive. Thankfully, the Alliance and Horde have fish people who somehow can breathe out of the water to help them. Also, Nathanos has Zalatath and needs to deliver it to Queen Ajara behind the Horde's back, and this happens off screen. Alright, everyone, we need to remain united and work together as a team. Therissa, find a safe haven so we can gather our troops. Blightcaller, Orga. Bl Blightcaller. Where are you going? I, uh, oh, I, uh, I was just, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going for a walk. E you know, need, need some fresh air. But we are in an extremely hostile environment. Those Naga will surely rip you to shreds. I, uh, um, uh, look! Azerite! Where? Athanos delivers the blade to Ashara, and we go into her palace, and somehow she didn't expect the Horde and the Alliance to work together, despite us working together again and again for the past 15 years. Ashara is defeated, but Nazoth is released from his prison and pulls Ashara into the darkness. While all of this is going on, there's also a subplot about Sylvanas raising Derek Proudmore, kidnapping Bane Bloodhoof, and wanting to burn down Thunderbluff. This plotline culminates in the Horde and the Alliance forces marching to the gates of Orgrimmar to stop Sylvanas. I'm not talking about any of this plot because it all gets resolved in BFA, and uh, this video is already way too complex with the story elements I am explaining. What you need to know is Sarfang is an old orc and he wants to die an honorable death. He challenges Sylvanas to a duel. Sylvanas is frustrated because her plan is falling apart and she says, The Horde is nothing. You were all nothing. Also, guess who wins the duel? He needs some milk. After this outburst, Sylvanas is obviously not the war chief anymore, and she flies away like a cartoon villain. Sylvanas then hangs out in the Ghostlands, sulks, and explains her plan. My bargain with Ajara will yet bear fruit. The armies of Azeroth will fight her master, and he will line their streets with corpses. In the end, he too will serve death. So Sylvanas' plan was for Enzoth to kill everyone on Azeroth and then she will enslave Enzoth. Right. This marks the end of the Fourth War and the Horde and the Alliance are best friends again. Enzoth's grand plan after being released is crept in two old zones no one cares about, and with the help from stupid sexy Rathion, we enter Enzoth's home called Nihilotha. In Nihilotha, we help Queen Ajara who is being tortured. Ajara says thanks by pulling Zalatath out of her butt and giving it to Rathion. Then she kind of just exits stage left and we don't hear from her again. Rathion uses Zalatath to open a hole in the Zoth and we defeat him by shooting a giant laser beam. He might not actually be dead, his essence might be in Zalatath, but uh, who knows? What we do know is Azeroth is now purified of all corruption and somehow I just explained all of BFA without talking about Magni. In the book Shadows Rising a lot of stuff happens. All you need to know is the Horde and the Alliance are looking for Sylvanas. Sylvanas also ordered Nathanos to kill Bombswamba because he's been stopping troll souls from entering the maw. Sha! What, what you doing here, man? It's not your time to pass on. <laughs> Yet. And sending them to the troll afterlife, which is called the other side. Nathanus fails in killing Bobby Salami like the loser he is. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sylvanas is conducting phase two of her master plan. 
But no king rules forever. What the fucking shit are you down the mark for? Playing your fucking mouth, mate, to my bro, man. You sent me a message first, yeah? I live in Smevic, Birmingham. If you want the fucking bro, come down to Smevic, that's for Danny G. I'll come to the house, and I'll take your fucking leg. You know what the fuck? And then Bolvar gets his ass kicked. With the Helm of Domination destroyed, the barrier between the Shadowlands is obliterated, allowing the Jailer and his minions direct influence in our plane of existence. Also, since there's no Lich King, the Scourge have gone in a frenzy and Azeroth has a cherry on top. First, we need to deal with this Scourge infestation, and then we need to delve headfirst into this unknown realm. BFA's story out of the way. What is going on in Shadowlands? Well, there's an ancient being called the Arbiter. This entity judges all souls that enter the Shadowlands and directs them to their appropriate afterlife. If you live a selfless life where you sacrifice yourself for others, you go to Bastion. If you live the life of a mighty warrior who values strength, you go to Maldraxxus. If you live a sinful, wicked life, you go to Revendreth to repent for your sins. And if you live a life with a connection to nature, you go to Ardenweald to help in the process of rebirth. These are just four of the limitless dimensions within the Shadowlands. But the issue is, mysteriously, the Arbiter has ceased to function causing all the souls to drain directly into the Maw. Within the Maw, there is a constant flowing slipstream of souls, filled with the cries of ghostly agony as they are damned to feed the unsatiable hunger of the Jailer. Totally random side tangent here. Back in Hellfire Citadel, there was a boss called Gorefiend who gorged on so many Draenei souls that he became this obese monstrosity. I think Shadowlands would have been much better if the Jailer was just like sitting at the end of the slipstream and he was just like this giant, obese, Jabba the Hut looking dude and he was all like, GET IN MY BELLY! Since all the souls are going into the Maw, every other dimension in the Shadowlands is starved of anima. Anima is the life source every being has when they die. The more experiences you have in life, the more anima you produce. Experiences like your first kiss, your big promotion at your job, killing a shit ton of orcs, and smashing the like button on your favorite YouTuber's video. Also subscribe. All of these experiences fill your soul with anima. And for everything to function in Shadowlands, these dimensions need it. But with the Jailer gobbling it all up, all of the other zones are in a drought, and we as the player characters are there to help. And that is all the lore you need to know to start your adventure in the Shadowlands. I'll be making more detailed videos about the lore and the expansion after it is released. I hope you guys are excited as I am, and I'll see you later. <laughs>
Phillips. I want my baby back, baby back, baby back, baby back.